All right. Welcome to the Ultra High Net Worth Clients podcast, everyone. I'm your host, Chris Broadhead. We started this podcast as a way to create a central resource of the best financial advisor practice growing tips shared by the most outstanding advisors in the industry, of which our guest today is definitely one. These outstanding financial advisors agree to be on the show and provide a ton of value for free, all in the hopes that our audience might learn from their words. My father was a financial advisor, and financial advisors are the main clients we serve, so my marketing agency's mission is to help every financial advisor grow their business in an effort to help the world become more financially secure. Today, we have the rare pleasure of talking with an incredible financial advisor, Don Morgan. Don, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Chris, it's my pleasure, and I love your mission statement. Uh, I'm sure your dad would agree with this. I tell my team all the time, what we do as financial planners and advisors is arguably the most noble part of the world of finance. And that isn't to say bankers don't do good things or factoring companies or flooring companies or acceptance firms. All of them have a role to play. But if you have a financial planner in your life, especially if you're a business owner, and they've done their job right, what we've done essentially is take care of your widow and your orphans. God forbid something bad happens before they even know their widows and orphans. Mm. And if there's a more noble part of finance, I haven't found it. So mm. we're proud of what we do. As I say, I'm sure your dad would agree with me. And the more people that recognize that good advice is worth paying for, the better off our society will be financially because it's gotten more and more complex. The days of simplicity in finance are not gone forever. In fact, part of our goal is to help simplify the financial structure within the, the, the parameters of what we're trying to accomplish. But it's simply not our dad's and our granddad's world of finance. It's very complicated. It's sometimes terrifying. We want to do a couple of things. We want to take the fear out of finance. And we want to help people win at the great game of finance. And if we can do that, we're going to do that in the context of a plan. The other thing I liked about your introduction is you want to help financial advisors be better financial advisors. And so I think what we'll talk about today, I hope, are some of the efficiencies that over the last eight years we've applied to our practice that literally any financial advisor can do. And hopefully, if they listen to this podcast, they'll avoid the many painful missteps we made along that journey. I, I jokingly tell people we're a 14-year-old overnight success story. <laughs> and we started in the independent, staff, independent space in 2010. I spent 15 years before that with two great wirehouse firms, proving to myself and a series of branch managers that I'm really not a great corporate employee. <laughs> my clients love me. My branch manager is not always so much. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's, let's dig into that. So I, I normally like to start at the, the genesis of your entrance into this field. How, how did you get into this wild world of finance? It, it's a great question, Chris. Uh, the, the short story is I didn't end up going to the Air Force Academy and since that option got closed off two weeks before I got on the airplane to Colorado Springs, I was 18 years old. And I, I, I may have been just a little bit young and arrogant because I didn't bother applying anywhere except the Air Force Academy because I knew I was going there. And I mm. had my acceptance letter. I had my bags packed. And then I get this telegram saying, you know, this year, your eyesight, ah, we can't take it. Oh, wow. Well, I'm standing there at 18 years old in July going, now what? And so I had to scramble around and find something other than the Air Force Academy. So I ended up going to Los Angeles City College and Cal State LA. And I think it was in my second year there, I saw a, a card on the bulletin board that I found out later had been there since 1973, offering to train people to be private investigators. And I was tired of working nights. It was a day job. I figured I'd switch to night school. And it was a financial boutique in downtown LA that did collections, private investigations, and repossessions. 
So I started out on what I call the dark cat side of finance. Mm. And my first few months, I hated it. And then the, the, the light bulb came on and I realized that at the other end of the telephone was somebody who had a financial problem. They owed a bill that was unpaid and that I was really good at helping people solve financial problems. And so instead of the knuckle dragging Neanderthal reputation of the ugly bill collector, I became that guy that would help you figure a way out. And I got really good at analyzing people's balance sheet, income statement, and family structure to come to solutions. I was so good at it. I got into management before I was 20 years old. And the owner of the company wanted me to start helping him run his portfolio. At that time, it was all fixed income. So he had me go through the general securities licensing education course. I didn't need the license because I was just working for him. But he not unreasonably wanted me to know what I was doing. And so I learned about money markets and CDs and bonds. And then a little bit later, stocks and mutual funds. And the fascination grew. And when we sold our company, because I ended up, my wife and I ended up when that company sold, starting our own. When we sold that and moved here to the Northwest in 1992, I ended up being recruited by Smith Barney. And I started with them in 94. And I just hit the ground running, not without a lot of missteps. I mean, the, the, the great thing about this field is you become an entrepreneur. The downside to it, like every entrepreneur, even though we had branch managers, you really don't have a boss you can go to and say, hey, Chris, I got this thing going on. And I can't figure it out. You got to make decisions. You got to be responsible. Mm -hmm. And you're going to make mistakes and you have to learn to, to fail forward as rapidly as you can in ways that don't hurt your clients. And ultimately don't hurt you and your family, because if you destroy your business, you can't work in it anymore and you can't take care of anyone ever again. So you got to take care of the whole enchilada, if you will. So it's a crash course in business. The good news is I'd already owned a business. And I understood the mechanics of how to build a business and to successfully sell it. And so I started working with local business owners. And I'll shorten this. It just became a passion for me, helping them figure out the way the world works in a fashion that allowed them to do a better and better job. And along the way, my family's always been part of my, my work world. We don't, you know, you'll hear people talk about work-life balance. We really do work like blend. It's blended mm -hmm. together. There really isn't a clear delineation. Uh, sometimes over the dinner table, we'll talk about work. Sometimes at work, we'll talk about vacations, right? Mm -hmm. And right now, the way we've structured our business, all three of my kids and my wife and I are the core of the business. And then we have another 20 to 30, depending on the, the structural period that we're in, um, what we call fractional or virtual teammates. And so eight years ago, we decided to really jumpstart our business. And that's why the overnight success story took so long. Um, one of the things that frustrated us is no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't break through a, a glass ceiling, a revenue ceiling. And we started analyzing, and we keep good records, where was my time being spent? And this research we did mirrored the research Bill Good did in the 80s and Michael Kitsis has done in, in the last decade. Most of the time, we're not in front of clients. And so we, we analyzed it. And every time I was in front of a client, I made X amount of money. But I was only in front of maybe five or six clients a week. So we started pushing towards getting that up to a triple number. And not surprisingly, the more I visited with clients, the deeper the share of wallet, the more I understood their needs. We also started the process of charging for financial planning instead of giving it away. This was a giant leap, Chris. And the world in, in my industry is divided between those who give it away for free and those who charge. And it's very hard to cross from one side to the other. 
by charging, what we found out is when people are paying for a service, they take it more seriously. That creates a virtual cycle where we have to take it more seriously and do a better job. And so we, six years ago, seven years ago, did a deep dive into the world of permanent life insurance. Life insurance is a critical function of risk management and financial planning. And almost everyone who gives plans away solves that with a quick and dirty term policy. But that's not always the most appropriate thing to do. It's simply we're not getting paid. And so we're giving you sort of the minimum. As we did this deep dive, just like the the chasm between giving it away for free and paid is giant, the chasm between the, the what I'm going to call the term policy people and the cash, po- cash value policy people is huge. And it's very hard to bridge that gap. And it's even harder to understand the psychology of the life insurance sale. So we had to go through a two to three year period of doing a deep, serious dive in educating ourselves and our team on how this is used, why it's used, and how it's positioned so the clients recognize the value. Along the way, we started working with LPO on developing out our operational ethos, which we now define as innovation, automation, outsourcing, simplification, and elimination. And so part of that innovation, one of the very first things we did was we created an automated scheduler so that if someone wants to make an appointment with us and it's three o'clock in the morning, they can just click on a button on our website and they can get an appointment scheduled and the full knowledge that it's on my calendar, the Zoom meeting link has been sent or the in-person meeting confirmation has been sent and they'll get a reminder call the day before. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that's another thing we found. Once we started making those phone calls the day before, our failure rate on appointments went from about 40% to about 5%. Mm. If you think of a dental office model, if dentists had 40% of their patients not show up, that's like losing 40% of their daily revenue. Mm. And so it was critically important. Little tiny thing. By the way, we did it wrong the first time. Then we did it wrong again. Then we got it right. Um, After that, it was starting to add on virtual teammates rather than W-2 teammates. Because it turns out that most advisors, especially the solopreneur or the small office, home office, aren't very good at sourcing new employees, interviewing new employees, onboarding new employees, training new employees, and then retaining new employees so they become longtime career employees. It's just not a natural thing for someone whose brain is wired to be a financial puzzle solver and advisor. Mm. HR is a different world, and I'm not criticizing HR, but most small offices have zero HR capability. And so by going to fractional and virtual employees, you lay off all of those HR duties on the organization that you contract with. So we have virtual teammates from LPL, our broker dealer. We have virtual teammates from Mariner, our OSJ, that's industry jargon for the intermediary between us and and our broker dealer, LPL. Um, And then we have third-party virtual teammates who are fully vetted, they're fingerprinted, they're accepted by LPL, they work for multiple LPL reps, but they don't work for LPL or our intermediary, they work for an independent company. And then finally, we have non-industry virtual teammates, such as virtual reception, virtual tax preparation, virtual um, tax planning, all of that's built virtual para planning, in fact, we, we ran the pilot project for LPL's paraplanning department, which is now one of their largest enterprise departments. When we came on board, it didn't exist. And, and we led the effort to create it and promote it. So it's part of our DNA is helping other advisors win at this noble field of financial advice. Because we're really financial advocates and financial Sherpas. We're helping Chris and his family. We're helping Susie and her family navigate 
the sometimes scary and sometimes mysterious world of finance, right? So two, two quick case studies, someone getting their annual open enrollment package at big corporation. They get a stack of paperwork like this and they have two weeks to answer all these questions and they don't know what they should be saying and HR won't give them advice. Business owner who hits that plateau and can't figure out how to break through, who does he talk to? He doesn't have HR to go to or an owner. He is the owner. In each of those cases, we come in and we're not telling people we're the smartest guy in the room, but we know people we can bring in to help them resolve these. I'm going to give one more example. Every client we have knows someone in their family or they themselves have student loans. So we partnered with a firm that does professional student loan counseling at zero cost to our clients. We've had amazing results on that. So that's that innovate part. How do we innovate to set ourselves apart, to, to be different and better without losing the core of who we are, which is people who care deeply about our client's success. We never want the automation to be a barrier. We want it to take barriers down. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I know that was a long-winded answer. I hope it, it gave you what you were looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. A, a lot to dig in there. Um, so, Don, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, two wirehouses. And then in uh, 2010, you said you you went independent. What, yeah. what was finally the... The straw that broke the camel's back that you're like, that's it. I'm going to do, I'm going independent. It, it was April 9th of the year 2009. Mm, okay. And Didn't my order. wife and I were at the <laughs> National Center for Employee Ownership Conference in Portland, Oregon. And I was literally just walking in the door. And one of my teammates here in Spokane, when I was the branch training delegate for one of the big wirehouse offices. And one of my trainees called me. Remember, 20, 2009 was the heart of the global financial collapse. Oh, yeah. I remember it well. Said, Don, they're escorting us out of the building. I'm like, what do you mean? She said, no, they're they're reducing the, the workforce. Anyone under a certain level, they're just, they've got armed guards here. They're taking us out of the building. We don't work there anymore. Oh, my gosh. And five of my trainees got fired that day. So I got on the phone. I helped them get on board with LPL um, and took care of them. But one of them, the one that called me, I was supposed to team with when I got back the following week. And there's no doubt in my mind that had I teamed with her before I left, they wouldn't have laid her off. Mm. And so as we're driving home and from Portland to the Spokane area where I live, is about a six hour drive. And there's parts of the drive that are just long segments of almost nothing. And in, in part of that long segment of all, almost nothing, there's this growing silence in the car. And out of the blue, my wife says, you know, honey, I just don't think they care much about us. And I said, you know, I think you're right. And she said, you know, I never thought I'd say this, but maybe we should start our own company again. And so in April of 2009, on the drive home from Portland, we talked out the big structure, and then we made some phone calls to one of my clients who's a strategic planner, one of my clients who is a high-end estate planning lawyer and tax accountant, another client who is a property and casualty insurance agent, another one who is a computer IT specialist, and we gathered them all together as our board of advisors. And over the next nine months, we designed the plan that we executed on January 15th of 2010. So we're actually a company that was designed with a purpose. And I would argue that if you're going to start a business, you want to start it the way we did with good advice from people that are in other disciplines and with an end in mind. Have the end in mind when you start it. Now, we started with a 10-year plan. We've moved it to a 20-year plan because one at a time, each of my kids came into the business and it's really exciting and they want to continue the business rather than sell it. We also have some pretty aggressive growth plans that I don't think I want to talk about right now, but are, are going to be really incredible as we execute on them. 
But the key to it is having a strategic plan. And the reason I say that is a strategic plan lays out what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. It gets me to know much faster. If you come to me and pitch, I want to sell you this shiny object. And and most of us are really easy to pitch for shiny objects. If it doesn't fit my strategic plan, my answer is no. If it does and it duplicates something else I have, then I put you into, we're going to go out to bid on either a one, two, or three-year cycle on every major vendor we have. The more mission critical it is, the slower the rebid. So my broker-dealer, we revisit every three years. Things like, you know, office cleaning, we'll revisit annually. Lawn service. Those are mission critical, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So having... Part of a strategic plan, by the way, is something called a crisis management plan. And I think it was March 17th of 2020, we pulled our crisis management plan out at nine in the morning because I was on a board meeting with the um, statewide um, insurance and financial planning organization. And one of my fellow board members at that time reported that five of her clients had died of COVID that week. Now, she was a Medicare supplement gal out of Kirkland, and that was ground zero in Washington State for the COVID infection. And so we pulled our crisis management plan out. We were, this was on a Friday. The state of Washington actually closed down on the following Monday. We closed down and went virtual 72 hours before the state did. And my most senior financial planner at the time, who has since retired, said, Don, I've worked for big corporations. I've worked for small companies. I've never seen anyone turn on a dime like this company did. Because we have the plan, we know what to do, who to communicate with, how to communicate. We don't know what crisis is coming. We really don't. What we do know is there will be one. Mm -hmm. And so when there's a crisis, and, and by the way, On years where there is no crisis, and those are most years, we pull it out and we do what's called a tabletop. And we say, let's create a crisis. We've lost all power for the next 10 days. How are we going to manage? What do we do? Right? How do we Mm -hmm. take care of our clients? How do we take care of our stakeholders? So having that pre-planned crisis management plan, the other two documents that every financial advisor should have up to date with whoever their, either their compliance officer is or their broker dealer or their RIA is what's called a business continuity plan. And they should also have a business succession plan of which the business continuity plan is a subset. So business succession in a perfect world is when my kids buy me out when I'm really old. Business continuity is if I get run over by that Mack truck two weeks from now, what do they do? And it doesn't matter if I'm dead or alive for a while after getting run over by a big truck, I'm not coming to the office, Mm -hmm. right? And if you don't have a written plan, what's going to happen is panic sets in and bad things occur. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to pretend COVID was easy. Nobody's going to pretend getting run over by a truck is easy. But if you have a plan and you practice to that plan, train to that plan, when bad things happen, you get things taken care of the way you'd want to, then you can panic, right? Mm-hmm. But first, we're, we're all aviation buffs here. I tell them, first you have to land the plane, then you can panic after you're on the ground. Absolutely. Um, any any advice on how our listeners can put together an effective strategic plan? Yeah, there's there's hundreds of resources out there. If they email me, I'll be glad to share some of our resources. Mm -hmm. I would say don't overthink it. And you don't want to create a 500 page document that no one will ever read. You want to create descriptions of processes, checklists, and documents that you can pull out when things happen. And ultimately you want to have, and when I was 20 years old and early in the management too early, I used to make fun of the consultants who would say this. I was wrong. I was young and arrogant. You have to have a written mission, vision, and value statement. And it has to represent who you truly are. And you want to publish that so the whole world can help hold you accountable to who you say you are. That's the very beginning. Then you want to define your end game 
And then you chop that up into pieces until you get to this year, this quarter, this month, and this week. A book I recommend that really does a great job, and there's a whole bunch of resources around it, is called Traction by Gino Wickman. Mm -hmm. And he defines in this book something called the Entrepreneurial Operating System. And in there, he gives you a single page document that gets you to this month, even this week, what do I need to accomplish? What are the things that could stop me? And what are the things that I need to delegate to somebody else? It, I don't know if you've ever heard that old college game about the rocks, the pebbles, the sand, and the water. Mm -hmm. You know, you have this big five gallon jug and you've got all this stuff. Well, if, if you put it in the wrong order, if you put the, the stuff in the wrong way, you can't get it all in. But if you learn how to put it in in the right order, you take care of the rocks first, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And that way, you know that the big stuff is taken care of. Uh -huh. What I'd really tell people is a strategic plan is a, a document that helps you run your business, but only if every month and every quarter and every year you benchmark to the things you said you're going to do. And I recommend strongly that you do a mini, at least half day retreat every three months, just the decision makers, yellow pads, number two pencils, no laptops, no cell phones, and ask yourself, are we doing what we said we were going to do? It's that sanity check that says, okay, we're a little off course. Let's stop it. Let's get back on course and back to what we're trying to do. And always remember, there's a lot of people that depend on you, especially if you've built a great practice. You have your clients that depend on you, your employees, your family, the vendors that you use. There's a lot of people depending on you, and the better you can handle your responsibilities, the more you can grow the economic value of your practice. And the faster you can do that, the better it is for everyone. That's the last thing I'll say on it. We talk about the dash in, in estate planning. We live from 1909 to 2009, 100 years, or from 1959 to 2009, 50 years or just a few months. However long we live, it's inside of that. The challenge is we know the beginning, we don't know the end. And so when people tell me I've got plenty of time, I'd answer, maybe. Two more books I recommend is Michael Gerber's E-Myth, or the E-Myth Revisited, published in the 90s. He'll tell you what a business mm -hmm. owner, and all, all advisors are business owners, whether they realize it or not, what a business owner ought to be doing. And he divides the world into three parts. I do the same. I use a different nomenclature than he does. I call them yesterday jobs, today jobs, and tomorrow jobs. And the, the business owner can be in any one of those categories, but all three categories have to be done. Then a book called Built to Sell. Mm, love that book. You by, is it John Warlow? Uh, yeah. What John tells you is how to do what Michael said you ought to do. <laughs> and the thesis behind built to sell is you could get run over by that Mack truck tomorrow and your spouse will have to sell your business. Is it ready? Mm -hmm. Because if not, the economic value goes poof. Yeah. It's gone. The... Final book that I'd recommend, if you really want a master class on growth, and he, he's a, a brilliant coach, a gentleman named Dan Sullivan runs an operation out of um, Chicago. I've never worked with him. I know him by reputation, and his reputation is stellar. Uh, his company's called Strategic Coach, and the book he wrote last year was 10x is easier than 2x. Mm. And I will tell you, you have to power through the first couple, three chapters, because it starts out very odd. If you know Dan Sullivan's work, it's how he does things. But he does it deliberately to carry you through to where you go, aha, I can do that. And so we've gone on a, a half hour journey from 1977 till now and a whole bunch of painful mistakes. But what we built 
is a sustainable, transferable practice with very sticky clients who really love us because we love them back. That's one more thing I'll say to your viewers. If you're still using the ancient fog of mirror test to see if someone qualifies to be a client, I would suggest being a little more picky. We use a seven-way fit test to make sure that before we allow someone to hire us, that we want to be hired by them. And if any one of those seven are missing, we gently help them find someone else. We only want clients who will love us and who we can in turn grow to love. Awesome. Does that make sense? Awesome. Yeah, that makes it a ton of sense. <clears throat> Don, this uh, this is awesome, man. I, I wish we had uh, three hours. You were you were a wealth of knowledge, my friend. Um, where where can our audience find out more about you and everything you're working on? In today's world, the easiest way is independentwealthconnections.com, which is a nice long name. We keep trying to shrink it. If you want to go to iWealth Connect, it'll get you there. It all goes to the same website. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the easiest way. Donald.morgan at independentwealthconnections.com is an email address. And our phone number is 509 area code 9311088. My time is available to any advisor who wants to win in this business. I have a passion for it throughout my career from day one, not quite sure why I wandered into this goofy field of finance. Older, wiser, and better people have given me their time and their talent and taken the time to mentor me. And some of them actually succeeded in keeping me from doing dumb things. And so if I can help you or anyone else win at this great game of business, it's truly my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. And we'll be we'll be sure to link all of that in the show notes. Nice. Um, Don, this has been an absolute ple uh, pleasure. We're definitely going to have to have you back on to... to uh, Hear, hear more amazing insights. I'll tell uh, you it, one that would be fun, Chris, is if you wanted to do a panel with people that are familiar with AI and what it's doing in our industry, that's the, the, the that's probably a great the idea. game changer in finance in my career. Yeah, no, that's thank you for that idea. I'm, uh, uh, we'll, we'll definitely uh, keep talking about that. Um, but yeah, awesome. Thanks so much for, for coming on the show. Uh, to all our listeners out there, thanks so much for tuning in and keep on growing out there, everybody. See ya.